What is Microsoft Azure? Well, if you're new to IT, or you've been an IT administrator, but you've just done it on-premises, then at some point you're probably going to need to sign up for some sort of cloud service, as that's the way the industry is going. And what we see here is Microsoft's version of those cloud services, and this one is called Microsoft Azure. Microsoft has another main cloud service, and it's called Microsoft 365. Now, Microsoft 365 and Azure have some crossover, and this is where things can get confusing. So let's take it one step at a time. First, let's start with Azure. I'm going to click on More Services, and I'm going to see all the different services that are here. Now, every month, Microsoft is adding more services than there were the month before. So I remember checking this out a year ago, and pretty much everything fit onto one page. But now, look at this. We've got pages and pages of various different services that Microsoft offers. So the difference between this and buying software is Microsoft Azure will host the application or the server, whatever it is that you're renting in the cloud, and they'll charge you a monthly fee for it. Whereas if you buy an application, you'll need your own server. You'll need to buy the application, install it, back it up, and manage it yourself. Once you pick the service that you want and you purchase it, then you can go ahead and manage that application or manage whatever it is that you're getting. So you can see on the left-hand side the category. So if you want to view less icons, such as by clicking on networking, then we'll just see things that relate to networks. Now, some of the things do have some crossover. So you may find some things in both networking as well as web or networking and storage uh, or general and containers. So you might see some of this crossover. It's available in more than one spot. But let's back up even further. So let's just go to a Google search and type in sign up for Azure. And there's our sign up for Azure option. You can click start for free. And then you can sign up and receive some credit for some services. And in this case, it's going to say, hey, let's create a new account. If you want, you can use a Microsoft account you've used in the past or just create a brand new one by clicking on Get a New Email Address. Or you could use your phone number. I'm going to click on Get a New Email Address. And it's going to append whatever it is I put in here at Outlook.com. So I'm just going to put in some characters here. I'll put a lot of random numbers in. Finally, I got it. All right, so now we need to enter the password we'd like to use with our account. We can securely generate a password like that, or we can just type in our own. Now, we have to use at least one uppercase, one lowercase, at least a number or special character, and it has to be of a minimum length. I'm going to uncheck the box that says I'd like more information and click Next, and I'm going to say, yes, I do want to save that password because I'll never remember that. And now you want to put in the country of, or, or region that you live in, as well as a birth date. And I'm just putting in some random numbers. That's not actually my birth date. And then you've got to put in these characters. Now, you don't have to put any spaces here or use upper or lower case. Just type them in as you see them. And then click Next. And now we're in the Sign Up page. From here, what you're going to see is you're going to get included 12 months of free products with a $200 credit. Now, it's really easy to get past that $200 credit. So even though you're going to be putting your credit card number in there, you think that, oh, I'll never hit $200 in charges. Well, think again, because you probably will. You want to make sure you go back in and check your account to make sure you're not spending too much as you play with all these different products. So you're going to uh, identify yourself. You're going to put in your phone number, your credit card, and sign the agreement. Once you have all that done, you'll be logged in, and it will be back to right where we were when we started the video. So I am signed in because I've gone through all that already, and Azure's going to come back on the screen for me. Now we're logged back in, and the big question is, is what do we start with? Well, let's just take a look at some of these categories here. We see one of the most popular ones is going to be a virtual machine. And this is using Hyper-V, but it's using Hyper-V in the cloud. And we can create a new virtual machine here, which I'm going to cover in an upcoming video. So you can check the playlist and watch me create a virtual machine. If you've got some good programming skills, there's lots of different options for you to use those here. And you've got skills such as Linux or PowerShell, various different uh, programming languages. Those can all be used in Azure. If I scroll down to networking, networking is typically getting either your virtual machines to talk to each other 
or getting your uh, virtual machines or physical machines on premises to talk to your cloud services that you decide to rent. So for instance, let's say you have a virtual machine you've created and then you want to be able to connect to that virtual machine from your on-premises. So you could create a VPN, for instance, between your location as well as the VM at Azure. So that's one way you can do that. There's lots of different options. You can also rent storage. Now you can attach this storage that you see here to the virtual machines that you can create, or you can just create the storage and attach to it from your Windows 10 or Windows Server and share that out. And I'll be covering that as well. Down here under web, we can create various different web services. This is typically where you would use your programming skills if you have those. And anytime you see one of these particular services that have preview next to them, it means that not all the bugs may have been worked out, but you can certainly test it out and try it if you'd like. Containers is really popular now. Containers basically run in their own memory, in their own file systems, uh, inside a computer or a virtual machine. And what it allows you to do is to spread the load out or be able to move your instances of your containers from one location to another. A very popular type of container would be a web server. So you can create a web server as a container in an operating system. And what's great about it is, is it runs completely separately from the operating system. Sure, it runs inside the operating system, but it runs with its own files. And that ability to move it around and load balance, create clusters, that kind of thing, makes it very flexible. It also makes it very secure as well. Under databases, you can certainly install SQL Server onto your virtual machine, or you can run SQL Server separately all by its own. There's another type of service that's becoming popular nowadays, and that is what's called serverless computing. And so you don't end up configuring a server. You just configure the application, and you'll never actually have control of any of the servers because Microsoft refers to it as serverless. Now, of course, there is a server someplace in the back end, but you just have no control over it because you don't need to. You can now connect to a SQL Server database, for instance, from on-premises or from anywhere in the world, and you don't need a server to do it. Blockchain allows us to have a secure type of computing environment because the blockchain service is going to be installed on a whole bunch of different devices. So it's going to be almost impossible to uh, hack into it because you'd have to hack every single device. So this is becoming very popular as a way of creating a secure application or managing one. Internet of Things, uh, as many have heard, has a lot to do with devices. But those devices have to have software that run on them. So from here, you can create a database for which the Internet of Things device is attached to it. An Internet of Things device might be a refrigerator or a toaster or anything other than a traditional computer type of device. You can synchronize your on-premises Active Directory to the Active Directory in Azure, or you can create a separate Azure Active Directory and just use that for authenticating your users. So it can be a little tricky, so it's not a good thing to start out with on your own, but it's uh, certainly something that you can work towards. And this is one of those things that does cross over with uh, Microsoft 365, which used to be called Office 365. So for instance, if you had moved your email to Microsoft 365 and your users log into Windows, for instance, and then they log into Outlook and they get prompted for a separate username and password. Well, by synchronizing Active Directory between on-premises and into Microsoft 365 using Azure Active Directory, you no longer have to type a username and password twice, once to get into your computer and once to get into Outlook. You can have what's called single sign-on and it'll automatically authenticate to both. Intune is a managed monthly service where you can manage your devices. You can push the Intune client out to, say, Android and iPhone and Windows devices, and you can manage those devices in a monthly type of a basis rather than purchasing an application and managing it on a server, such as with System Center Configuration Manager or the System Center Suite. So Intune basically creates a lot of these policies for you, although you can customize them, and it does a lot of the work for you if you'd uh, like to 
be able to control your devices that way. So we see lots more different types of things in here. Some things an average IT administrator will never use. I mean, the typical IT administrator that is doing cloud services may only take advantage of a half a dozen of all these different services. But Amazon Web Services, which was really the inventor of this whole cloud service uh, on, a, on a massive scale, that is, really started out with some great services and Azure is playing catch up a little bit. And so uh, they are throwing as many different services as they can to make it look like it's uh, going to be a great value. And it really is a great value at this point. So should you go with Azure? Should you go with Amazon Web Services? Since I'm very Microsoft centric, I'm a Microsoft certified trainer, I have lots of different MCSEs and certifications, I just naturally gravitate towards Azure. But uh, people who are more Linux uh, or Unix oriented, they tend to gravitate towards AWS. But Azure does support Linux and Unix. Uh, you can install virtual machines based on Linux as well. And you can use, of course, containers, which uses Linux. I'm gonna go to virtual machines. Here's my virtual machines. I've got client one, I've got DC one. So basically I created a domain controller on a virtual machine. You can use Microsoft Azure's Active Directory where you don't have to create it on a virtual machine at all if you don't want to. But for demonstration purposes, I had created this for a course that I did. So if I click on client one, for instance, that'll launch up Windows 10 or DC one, we've got a Windows 2019 server. So when I highlight it, I can click start and it's going to start that virtual machine and I can see that this is the IP address for that machine so if I connect to it using remote desktop I'll be able to see a full version of Windows uh, Server 2019 and in this case it's data center wait for that to start up looks like it has so now I'm going to open up remote desktop and then I'm going to log into it so I'm going to copy this uh, IP address there. It says copy to clipboard. Now I'm going to open up remote desktop. So I'm going to type in on my search remote desktop. I'll paste in my public IP address, click connect, and it's going to prompt me for my username and password. And now it's logging me into this virtual machine that is a Windows Server 2019 server. And if I click on local server, it'll tell me the name of it. There it is, DC1. And I created the domain techpub.internal for it. And from here, if I want to, I can install any of the same roles and features that I could install if this was an on-premises virtual machine or an on-premises physical server. But I also have other controls that you can see here. So besides starting and stopping the virtual machine, I can make various different changes. We've got properties that you see here, the size, the amount of RAM. I have eight gigabytes. If I shut that down, I can add more RAM if I want, but it'll cost additional money. I can click on monitoring, and it'll tell me all about how the server has been performing. I can click on capabilities. If I want, I can create a backup of it. I can go into security, auto shutdown, and various other options. And when I'm all done, I can shut it down either from the web interface, or I can just right click on the virtual machine and choose shutdown. We see stopping virtual machine at the top right. And if I want, I can click on activity log and it'll give me an update as it's shutting down. We click on this little bell at the top and it tells us that it has successfully stopped the virtual machine after earlier starting it. If I click back on home, it takes us back to the original location where we started. These are the different resources that I've created at one time or another. And it shows here that my servers are here, client one and DC one. It also shows a resource group I created for backing up. My pay as I go set up for paying for the monthly fees that are associated with Azure and other information. So that gives you a general overview of what Azure is, how you can use it, and how you can get started by creating your very first resource.